we're going to have a look at three-dimensional molecules. So what we've seen is that in order to properly represent a covalent molecule, we need a Lewis structure. A Lewis structure highlights where all valence electrons are in a given molecule. Um, and we've seen that this is a nice, quick, easy approach uh, way to, uh, to, get a, to get an idea of what a molecule looks like. But what we've seen and what we were introduced to was that a Lewis structure isn't quite enough because just like you and I, uh, molecules are three-dimensional entities as well. So we need to respect the fact that these are not just drawings on a page and we're going to need a little bit more information. Okay, and the reason for this is uh, we need to consider the three-dimensional properties, properties so that we can properly account for physical properties. Why do some things melt at one temperature rather than another? Okay, how is it that when all of these molecules come together we, uh, we get a certain type of shape or macromolecular property? So we'll deal with all that a little bit later, but first of all, um, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to look at what's called Vesper theory. Vesper theory is valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, all right, which is a very big name, so hence the acronym. Basically means electrons take up space. All right, so we see that right here, all right. Electrons are all negatively charged. They don't want to be near other electron pairs, okay? So electron pairs will repel one another. Okay, and a molecule will orient itself in three dimensions to minimize the interactions of the electron pairs. Okay, a lone pair takes up more space than a bonding pair. So right here, all right. So basically, what we find there is that uh, presence of lone pairs, specifically on central atoms, causes molecules to uh, distort their shape away from, let's say, ideal geometries. Okay, what do I mean by ideal. So things, if we, if we consider essentially molecular geometry based off of this tetrahedral concept down here, so tetrahedral geometry is one where uh, we have a, a central atom. So let's get ourselves a new slide here. So if we have a central atom, consider carbon, and I have four different uh, substituents on it. So uh, I'm going to draw this in three dimensions, so this wedge that I'm drawing right here is as if the bond is coming out of the screen at you in this broken line as if it's going backwards into the screen. Okay, so this is methane, CH4, right? And methane, right, is a perfect tetrahedron. The bond angles between all the, car the hydrogens are 109.5 degrees, okay, and this is as far apart as these hydrogens can get from one another without getting too close to another hydrogen. Okay, so this is the maximum separation that two hydrogens can have. Now, if we consider taking this molecule, all right, and we'll just move it around a little bit here, all right, and if I copy this, all right, and if I were to copy it again, I'm going to see that I can get three different shapes out of this. But if I replace, for example, this carbon with, let's say, a nitrogen, all right, so I'm going to put a nitrogen here, all right, a nitrogen you'll find, so NH3, all right, has a lone pair up on top of the up on top of the nitrogen. So right here. And this lone pair is actually larger than the hydrogen it replaced. Okay? This changes the bond angle between all the hydrogens to 107. Now you're not responsible for the bond angles, but essentially what I'm trying to show you is that this uh, this lone pair has caused is is larger, so it pushes all of these hydrogens closer together. All right, and we call this this shape is called um, trigonal pyramidal. All right. Okay. Now, if I then look at this, if I 
if I go to modify this again, so really, if I consider modifying the um, this tetrahedral atom molecule again, okay, I'm going to take out now both the both the nitrogen uh, that was in the the center here. I'm going to remove the the hydrogen that was at the back as well. So basically, remember how I've evolved from methane to this is called ammonia. This is NH3. I'm going to draw a new molecule here, and I'm going to use this as water. So water has an oxygen atom in the middle. It has two lone pairs on the central atom. Okay, so remember these lone pairs are each of them are larger than the bonding pair that they replaced. So if we consider this lone pair to be replacing the first hydrogen and the second lone pair to re be replacing the second hydrogen. Now these two pairs of electrons are considerably larger than the original uh, atoms they replaced. As a result, it pushes these other, hi the remaining hydrogens even closer together, so closer than the 107 in trigonal pyramidal, and these end up being 104.5 degrees apart. This shape is called bent. Okay, so what I hope you can see here is how each of the shapes evolves from um, from tetrahedral. Now there's a couple other shapes on this list as you've seen. So um, there's linear diatomic. This is a straight line. So an example here is HCl. Linear triatomic. Three atoms in a straight line. Okay. The, the central atom uh, in this case would be carbon. So carbon dioxide is an example here. Water is a derivation of tetrahedral. Trigonal pyramidal is a derivation of tetrahedral. Okay, some example molecules are here. The only shape that we haven't covered is trigonal planar, all right, which we'll look at uh, in a moment here. But take note of these, uh, these columns. So number of groups connected to the central atom and number of lone pairs on the central atom. You can see uh, patterns here. So um, you can put this in with the flow chart that we've seen as well. So the flow chart that I've given you, the one with all the yes or no questions about um, taking a correct Lewis structure and then um, and then using that to predict a, a Vesper shape. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to actually have a look at some molecules and I want to have a look at uh, polarity and dipole moments, okay? So we're going to start nice and simple. We're going to start with H2. So I'm going to look here and I'm going to have a look at the electronegativities. All right. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of about 2.1. You may see it as 2.2. But the difference here is 0. Okay, so 2.1 minus 2.1 is 0. All right. This is a nonpolar molecule. And what this means is that the electrons in the hydrogen-hydrogen bond hydrogen hydrogen bond uh, don't favor either side okay so basically what we're saying is they're localized equally between the two sites okay the shape of this is linear diatomic okay and we would say that this is a nonpolar molecule come to something like HBr. Well, let's have a look at the electronegativities for HBr. HBr is also linear diatomic. It's a straight line. There's only two uh, atoms in it. But if I'm going to look at the electronegativities, I'm going to find that hydrogen is 2.1, bromine is about 2.8, okay? Which means this guy has an electronegativity difference of 0 0.7. Okay? This is what we call a polar covalent bond. All right. My apologies for the poor writing there. But basically what we're saying is that the two electrons that would be in this bond actually spend a little bit more time on bromine than they do on hydrogen. That makes bromine partially negative. So we use the, the, the lowercase delta, which makes hydrogen partially positive. Okay. As a result, 
this is a polar molecule. So that means that one end of the molecule, the bromine end, actually has more electrons at it than does the other end of the molecule. Okay. Now what happens here, and why is this important? Well, for example, if I have H2 and if I have HBr, so if I have a sample of each of these molecules, all right, if I have, so I have some H2s here, all right, I have another H2, and there's another one over here, and he's kind of off to the side, and there's no real reason for them to interact with one another, okay, because they're all nonpolar. What happens when I have HBr, okay, I'm going to use a different color here, HBr I have H and then Br. But now remember, this guy is delta negative, this guy is delta positive. Well, if let's say I'm going to draw a bubble around this to pretend it's a whole molecule, well what happens when there's another HBr? Negatives and positive attract one another. So the positive end of another HBr, so sorry this is delta positive, lines up against delta negative there, okay, and they're attracted to one another. Then here I'm going to have another setup. I have the positive, the delta positive hydrogen. It's going to line up, okay, and I'm going to have all these interactions. And as a result, the HBrs actually stick closer together. And what we'll find is that this will display in terms of physical properties. So we would find that because the, and we'll come to study this later this next week, or maybe this week, HBr will display um, a higher melting point than H2, okay, because those particles are actually forced to stick together, all right, due to this polarity, all right. So now what happens when we change and we look at a, um, a molecule that has two polar bonds? So carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, oxygen is 3.5, but don't forget this oxygen is also 3.5, okay? This guy is delta negative, this guy is delta positive, okay? But don't forget this guy is also delta negative, and this carbon is still delta positive. Okay, so if I could put some polarity arrows in here, they would go this way, and they would go this way. All right? I have two polar bonds, but I have a nonpolar molecule. Okay, so why is it that I have a nonpolar molecule? Each of those polarity arrows are pointing in opposite directions, and they have the same magnitude. So the electronegativity difference is the same. All right, it's if you 3.5 minus 2.5, it's an electronegativity difference of one pointing away from the carbon atom on both sides of carbon dioxide. Okay. Notice also there are no lone pairs on the central atom here. All right. This means that carbon dioxide has a very regular shape. All right. And thanks to the equal and opposite polarity arrows, okay, this results in a nonpolar molecule. Carbon dioxide doesn't want to stick to another carbon dioxide. So again, it's an example. It's similar to H2. There's no one side of carbon dioxide that actually has more electrons than another. Okay, so it won't interact well. So this ends up being a nonpolar molecule. You could visualize this using the simulator that we have from FET. All right. And I can say so if I had no bond dipoles in, I can put those on and I can see the bond dipole arrows. I could put the partial charges on. I don't really like this. It's kind of messy, so I'll pull that off. But what happens? There's no molecular dipole all right, when I turn this on, because there's no net pull of electrons in one direction rather than another. Okay, let's have a look at another molecule. Why don't we look at water? Okay. Water has a different shape. Water is bent, okay, it's angular, could be called V-shaped. All right, the electronegativities for hydrogen and oxygen, so hydrogen is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5, Okay, which means that these are polar bonds that run this way. Okay, the polarity runs up towards the oxygen, 
All right, so both the hydrogens are delta positive. All right, that makes the oxygen delta negative. All right. Now, I know that you're not necessarily responsible for uh, vector math at this point, but if I were to take a copy of each of these vector arrows, and I'll move them down here, for example, okay, and I take a copy of this one, we can say that they're equal in magnitude, so that means they're the same size, but th they're in terms of their left and right, they're opposite in direction. So here's what I want to show you. If I take these two arrows and I add them together, what happens? I essentially could get an arrow, right? If I were go to go back to my original starting point, let's say down here, all right, I could draw an arrow straight up to the top. That's what happens in this case. The inward portions of the of the bond polarity cancel one another out and as a result I get this polar molecule where the molecular polarity, so the molecular dipole, actually runs right up through the center of the molecule making down here between the hydrogens delta positive up here is delta negative. Now some of you are at this point going to be saying I don't understand. Here's my advice to you. Have a look at the difference between a molecule um, like carbon dioxide and water. What is it that water has on the central atom that carbon dioxide does not? Carbon dioxide has no lone pairs and as a result and both of the things connected to carbon dioxide are the same. Water, both of the atoms connected to carbon dioxide are the same but it has lone pairs. It's automatically a polar molecule. Alright, so this can be a little bit of a hint for you. All right. I'll refer, I'll refer you back to this chart. Okay, number of groups connected to the central atom. Well, linear triatomic and bent both have two, but number of lone pairs on the central atom. As soon as I start putting lone pairs on the central atom, I automatically get polar molecules. So if you're able to identify the shape, you're going to be able to tell me right away that it's polar. So bent is always polar. All right as is trigonal pyramidal, you'll come to see. All right, those are always polar. Tetrahedral, trigonal, planar, linear triatomic, and linear diatomic can be polar. It just depends on what is actually bonded to the central atom. So let's have a look. We'll finish this guy off, so we'll say he said he's bent, polar. All right, gallium trichloride. Gallium, there are no lone pairs on the central atom, so he can't, he's not automatically polar. And what we're going to see here is that each of these bonds is slightly polarized towards the chlorine. All right, but notice how it's the same in all directions. All right, so there's no lone pair on gallium. So it's flat. All right. The pull, all right, between of the electrons in each of these bonds towards the chlorines is the same in all directions. As a result, it's a nonpolar molecule. Okay. If I were to change the structure, if I were to pick a different molecule, if I were to look at something like gallium, and then if I were to put a fluorine, and um, let's even let's even go so far as just to say chlorine. All right, so they all have their lone pairs of electrons. All right. Fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. So as I can show this visually by drawing a larger polarity arrow. So the electronegativity difference would be larger here than it would be here. Okay. As a result, even though it's a flat molecule, even though um, all three bonds are polar, one of the bonds is far more polar than the other two. So this guy would be a polar molecule. Okay. What I would find is if I were to look at an electron map, I would actually see more electron density 
surrounding fluorine than I would either of the chlorines or the gallium. All right. So to have a look at another three coordinate shape, let's look. This is a little bit of an irregular one, but um, I could run through my flow chart. Is there a central atom present? Yes. Are there three, two or more substituents? Yes. Are there three or more substituents? Yes. Are there four or more substituents? No. Okay. Is there a lone pair present on the central atom? Yes. Well, then the shape is trigonal pyramidal. Okay. So from that earlier slide I just sh just showed you, as soon as there's a lone pair present on the central atom, it's going to be a polar molecule. Okay. Because this is going to be a more electronegative atom, and it's going to distort this into an irregular shape. I can do the individual polarity arrows, and I can say that at um, this is going to be polar towards nitrogen, this bond. Okay, nitrogen and chlorine are almost the same in terms of electronegativity, so these are almost nonpolar bonds. All right, as a result, I, I don't have three of the same atom bonded around the central atom. Okay, so immediately I could say that it's polar. I also know that it's polar because it has a lone pair. Okay, now, uh, we've already had a look at methane. All right, but let's just look at methane here again. So we'll draw methane, all right, CH4. Okay, we'll say this, that all atoms surrounding central are the same, no lone pair on central, nonpolar. Okay. Now, I could look at something, everything is the same. What if I were to change this, though, and I have a look at hmm, CF4? So we'll say up here, CF4. So carbon-fluorine bonds are highly polarized towards the fluorines. All right. But this is what I'm talking about. If, is everything the same, or is everything, or are certain things different? So these are all polar towards the fluorines. All right. So all the fluorines are delta negative. Okay. Okay, the carbon is delta positive in all the directions, but because all of the fluorine or all of the atoms bonded to the central atom are the same, this is a nonpolar molecule. All right, the electrons are pulled equally to all of the fluorines away from the carbon. All right, I also can look and say, oh, there's there's no uh, there's no lone pair. There'll never be a lone pair on a carbon atom um, in one of the structures you'll look at. So as long as there's no lone pair on the central atom and all of the things bonded to that central atom are the same, you're going to have a nonpolar molecule. All right. One last example here. So CFCl, BRI, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are all found in group 17. All right. So they are, for the most part, all uh, they're more electronegative than carbon. So I'm going to have a heavy polarity arrow this way, one that's slightly smaller towards chlorine. I'm going to have a tiny one pointing at bromine, and there's almost nothing that goes towards iodine. Actually, we'll even just take that out. So basically, I have four different groups I have on that central atom. There's no lone pairs, but as soon as I look at this and I say, well, there's four different groups on carbon, it has to be e one, because there's four groups, it has to be some form of tetrahedral, but there's no way that this can be nonpolar. This has to be a polar molecule. You won't be asked to draw the, the net dipole. We could, you know, approximate it, and it would look something like this would be the molecular dipole, all right? But we're not interested in that. What we're interested in is, can you recognize a molecule as polar or nonpolar by having a look at its bonds? Or some of you may be able to tell it just by what is the shape. All right, you may not have to look at the individual bond electronegativities. All right, what we're interested in is we want you to be able to tell tell us is a molecule polar and then 
what we'll come to study next week, we'll, we'll have a, a lab or two to look at this. How does that affect what we see on the macroscopic scale? So, it, a substance that is governed or that is made up of polar molecules, what you'll hopefully come to find is that maybe it has a higher uh, melting point than something that's nonpolar. So, why is it that hydrogen's a gas? Um, at room temperature, but water is a liquid, even though they're roughly the same size molecule. Okay, so uh, we'll have we'll, we'll have more time to look at this. I hope this has been helpful. Um, again, have a look at this uh, at this simulator. All right, we're gonna you'll have more time in class tomorrow, but build some of the molecules. So, for example, here's something like CH2O from your assignment last week. All right, here's the Lewis structure. There's a double bond to oxygen from carbon. There's a single bond to each of the hydrogens. Put the bond dipoles in. All right, there's, a s there's hardly an interaction between carbon and hydrogen here. All right, the largest bonding I polarity interaction occurs along the carbon-oxygen bond. So put the molecular dipole in. I'm going to see the dipole essentially runs straight up through car the carbon-oxygen bond. Okay, so this is a polar molecule. I could look at this though and say that this is a polar molecule without doing the individual bond dipoles because there's a central atom, there's no lone pair, so I'm not sure right away whether it's polar, but I say, hey, there are three things bonded to it, they're not the same, this can't be nonpolar. There's There's got to be a difference. So that automatically makes something like this uh, polar. All right, maybe one more from here. We can look at CH2, F2, and in initially you might say, well, there's two of each type. There's two fluorines and there's two hydrogens. Maybe this is nonpolar. Well, let's have a look. Remember, there's almost no polarity difference between carbon and hydrogen, so there's no net dipole there, right? And remember, these exist as three dimensions. Right? You're not just doing a Lewis structure, which you can easily write the fluorines opposite one another. Notice there's this is they're not 180 degrees to one another, they're 109.5. So what happens to the molecular dipole? It's a very polar molecule. Okay. So this yellow arrow is the vector math solution. This is where we actually add up the those arrows and we say, okay, what's the what's the resultant vector? We don't need to do that. We can look at the carbon and say there are there's not four of the exact same thing bonded to it. It must be a polar molecule. Okay, so you'll have more time tomorrow in class to work on the lab and hopefully it goes well.